I'm going to make this video in parts, part one, two, three, however many it ends up being. And then once I've completed all the parts, I'm going to paste them all together into one long video and go back and delete the parts. This is a 1957 RCA black and white. It's a KCS 98 chassis and this is in for repair. Uh, it looks to be a very low hour set. This is a super. It's in very good shape. There is a swivel base that it mounts on that's not here. It's metal. And it's got like a photo finish type wood grain on it. I hope that's not too bright and blowing out because I'm actually using a uh, studio 600 watt studio uh, movie light. KCS 98 and he has turned it on a few times and the previous owner I guess turned it on a few times so it's we know nothing shorted in it and it does kinda work he says the picture is pulled in and doesn't fill the whole screen so we'll take a look at that these RCA's around the KCS 100 uh, seem to have these weird circuit board designs as you can see the circuit boards the components are facing in and the tube sockets are soldered on the back of the circuit board and that's gonna make this working on this fairly interesting because um, it's almost like a predicta where there's really very limited access to to solder I mean look at and you can see the boards are staked in so it's not just like they're easy to come in and go out come in and go out easy to remove and reinstall so the first thing we'll do is we'll uh, get a baseline on it I'll, we'll turn it on and we'll put the NTSC generator on it and see what we got and also this video is going to be covering a lot of basics that way the uh, the owner can refer back to the video if it needs you know touch up of the vertical linearity or height or any of that stuff we're gonna go through all the basic um, setup and adjustments on this okay so here we go we're gonna power up now I'm not too worried about this because the uh, RCA filter capacitors seem to last pretty much forever. I've got, I would say, the vast majority of my RCA sets are all original. And um, this seems to be, looks to be very low hour, very low hour. Uh, and it has a 5U4. And generally, and it's fused. It's got a fuse over here. And generally, if the filters or anything shorted, the 5U4 will make pretty colors for a minute before it turns into a fuse. There we go. We're powered up. That needs to be cleaned. Let's see if we've got an image here. Oh, we kind of have an image. So let's see what we can do with this. This must be what he meant by a partial, a partial picture.
So let's see. That almost looks like the yoke is pulled back. That's the yoke. I'm going to move the purity magnet around. Just to, I mean, not the purity magnet, the uh, ion trap, and it's way off too. Okay. Actually, it looks pretty good. The vertical linearity at the top, the lines are spaced almost a quarter inch apart at the top. So the generator's on. Careful, this thing is like in mint condition. Oops. That's kind of weird. Uh, that's slowing it down way too much. This is adjusting the horizontal hold. Okay, there we go. We might actually need some filter capacitors here. I see some ripple in that. Actually, I see quite a bit of ripple. Humbar. So... Also, why when I adjust the horizontal does it fill out the screen on this side? adjusting the vertical height and linearity and I can't there we go the height and linearity pots are very all the pots are very dirty Usually the first thing I would do is check the CRT and look at the flyback and check the cathode current, but since it had been turned on and played with by other people, I'm not going to worry about it. And the CRT looks to be in excellent shape. Filter caps are cold. That's hot, but those are usually hot. So, that's our baseline. This is probably 90% of this is bad capacitors. Uh, the inability to set the vertical correctly. Look at the spacing of the lines at the top. Inability to set vertical correctly. Uh, not enough horizontal width. Um, 
ripple in the picture and the picture is twerking there we go when you have bad filter capacitors you twerk alright let's pull the chassis and check it out all right, remove the top knobs on the top. They pull straight off. Remove the uh, volume knob there. Uh, unplug the CRT. Unplug the yoke from right there. Um, this is interesting. It actually has this. I've never seen this before. The actual. RCA television serial number sticker on the CRT and then this right here this tuner looks like it unplugs so there's the RCA um, plug for the IF out of the tuner and then this unplugs I have to untie this little rope and then what I think I do boy that's uh, that's interesting the LED is strobing pulse width modulated flashlight is I unscrew those two screws right there those two quarter inch and then the whole volume assembly comes out and the tuner stays this is exactly how you remove this chassis you unbolt the volume control there and look at the brass shafts coming out of those pots this is when America was at its absolute peak right here and you leave the tuner in there I wonder what that wire is it looks almost like a piece of dial cord uh, disconnect the speaker disconnect the high voltage anode and then there's four little bolts and the chassis comes out absolutely beautifully serviceable and now we can have a look at the chassis oh, oh boy god what an actually it looks like it's now that I got it apart it looks like it's got quite a few more hours on it than I thought Look at that capacitor right there. It actually looks burnt up, cracked. Aerovox. So, there are quite a few capacitors here that have to be changed. And you can see, this is tough to hold the light, you can see here how the tube sockets come through the back. Um, right there, let me see if I do this, not nearly as good. You see how the tube sockets here come through the back, and then the leads are folded over and soldered, and all the components are on this side. So this this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. It's like thirteen there. Fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight. Um I don't believe there's any in the IF strip. Boy, they made the chassis easily easy to service, but then the way these stupid circuit boards are put in here, you could. Okay, we'll take a look at that one on the other side, right there. Yeah, I wonder what this is—a horizontal oscillator, obviously. And that looks like the audio output. Um, 
Yep. No, vertical output. They use a 6AQ5 for the vertical output. And the sync output and horizontal oscillator is a 6CG7. So that's the vertical uh, output and the sync and horizontal. So, of course, this is why the horizontal and the vertical are not working all these crappy wax capacitors all of these are gonna have to be changed when I first saw the set I thought uh, maybe we could get away with you know doing just just the bare minimum but I don't think so this is gonna need a lot of capacitors changed I wonder what kind 330 picofarad So, doesn't look like there's been any work done on it. There's a nice big honker right there. This might have been replaced right here. I don't think this is factory. I don't think they had these in the 50s. I think it was probably a sand resistor. One of those dog bone ovally ones. Lots of dominoes. Ooh, there's even some of those. These these capacitors right here are always bad. These bumblebees. These things right here are worse than the wax capacitors. And then the the those white ceramic ones, the Elminco. Those are pretty bad too. This thing is just full of bad capacitors. I wonder if there's any in here. Of course there are. Yes, there are. I wonder what that is right there. That's Oh, that's the audio output. Audio output, audio amp, and ratio detector, and sound IF. There are those three. So this right here is the sound board, so that's not as critical. The most critical is this area down here, and this area over here. These all got to be changed. Yep. So lots to do here. This is part one. Uh, part two will probably be see that board is completely inaccessible. It's gonna have the board is gonna have to come off. There's no way around it. This is predicta level. Um, this is predict a level irritation. Serviceability access is very bad. I was watching my video in the editor, uh, noticing how furry these capacitors were and kind of coming to the conclusion that it's much higher hour than we initially thought. So I figured I would test the CRT real quick before I went any further with it. Also I've been making this reference to a Predicta style and some people might not know what that is. Philco Predicta, Philco made a line of televisions in the 50s called Predictas and they're those real space AG plastic uh, George Jetson style um, things and I'm not a real fan of Predicta uh, my slogan for Predicta is all style and no quality so uh, this is the way Philco Predictas were made with the wire wrapped um, 
posts and the boards staked in so they're very hard to service. Now one one thing people do on the predictors, it's a pretty cheesy way of doing it, is instead of removing the board and desoldering um, each capacitor from the pad and then soldering the new capacitor in, in, in is to just cut the lead off right where it goes into the uh, unit. These dead spiders are pretty cool. Cut the lead off right where it goes into the capacitor and then just twist the new capacitor um, onto this one onto this old lead that's sticking out and solder it rather than removing the board. I don't know that might become an option here. I, I want to check the CRT first. Generally that's a pain in the ass because the leads are all coated with wax and cigarette crust and all this other stuff. Keep in mind I'm kind of explaining this in uh, terms that the owner can understand. Uh, so let's see. Which I'm probably failing horribly at. I'm not seeing a real kick-ass CRT here. If the CRT is weak, what's going to happen is the faces are going to look cloudy. That's the main thing you'll notice when there's a face on the screen. You know, when you're looking at a close-up of somebody's face it will appear cloudy and the features of their face will not be uh, distinct it'll just look kind of blurry and mushed out and you have to keep the brightness real low or else you'll just get that kind of cloudy blowout ideally what we want to see is we want to see up here between 9 and 10 or 0.9 and 1 and I'd like to see that on 5 volts because turning the voltage down is like a life test same as testing life and it's actually looking okay This is an interrupt switch. CRT checks okay, we can proceed. Okay, this is part two of the RCA KCS 98 restore repair. And I'm looking at the parts list trying to get together a list of the capacitors that I'm going to need. Uh, most of these are not disc. There's a f looks like there's a few discs up there in the IF, but besides that, the majority of them are paper. I'm not sure what these are. I've never I mean, I know what these are. They're they're the the metal film in the modern style, but I'm not sure. Those will have to just be tested. And um, there's the dominoes. We know that those mica dominoes, and this one might actually be paper inside a, that style case. But we know that these dominoes are starting to fail. So those will probably they have any voltage potential across them they'll probably have to be changed the 
So looking at the SAMs, there are um, those are the Electrolytics. Not many, two 100s, 20, 10, 20, and 5. That's, that's pretty conservative for Electrolytics. But then we get into the fixed capacitors and now the ones I'm mainly going to have to change are just the ones with the voltage value next to them because all of the all of the little small ones here 1018.5 those are all probably disc or tubular ceramic but there are 115 capacitors in here and it's probably only going to need about half of that because like I said they're disc and ceramic there's a lot of thousand volters in here though yeah, I wonder what this is C97 82 at a thousand and C 98 wonder what those are. Okay, this is uh, C97 and 98. These are these thousand volt deals. This was brought up in the um, comments and unfortunately I don't have the, CT, the KCS uh, 98 but the 97's got the same boards pretty much just in a different configuration this is the factory service manual and there's some very interesting reading in here um, that pretty much I think it was I forget the name Burnett or something like that um, Replacement of components on printed circuit board. Inconvid individual components mounted on the printed circuit board may be easily replaced and the proper technique is used. Only extensive damage to the printed... Uh, when removing and complacing components, every possible precaution should be taken to prevent damage to the connecting strips. Carsa traces. And this is how they this is how the RCA factory manual says to do it. Cut it or crush it and then loop. So cutting and then loop it over and solder the new one in. To replace capacitors or resistors on printed circuit boards without removing the boards from the chassis, proceed as follows. Cut the component in half with a pair of diagonal cutters. Remove the body of the component from the connecting wires, leaving as much wire as possible. Per prepare connecting points. This is interesting. This is how the factory says to do it. and. You can pause on this and read it if you care to. Replacement of sound IF transformers. The factory manual is always so detailed. And then what's cool about this is it gives you a layout it gives you a whole page on every board so it gives you the schematic 
then it gives you the front shot and the back shot with all the test points. And of course they give you a very detailed parts list for each board. Paper fixed capacitor 0 0.033 20 percent 400 volts DC very very well done so the question is do I want to crush and cut these out or do I want to unsolder them and I'm really leaning towards pulling the boards and replacing the components simply because there are so many of them. If it was one or two capacitors, I could see doing that, but you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. There's like 13 capacitors on this one board that have to be changed. So, and then, you know, some of these, like those, really have to be, I really need to test those. And there's nothing to crush and cut off there. So, I don't know. But the first thing to do is to, this is also the RCA board parts layout and the factory schematic the first thing to do is uh, photocopy the SAMs and go down to the electronics store and probably spend two hours trying to dig all these capacitors up okay I got my copy of the SAMs I'm here at the electronics store Luckily, we still have a local electronics store that stocks all of these, and uh, they just they just give me access to it and let me go on and get what I need to. Most of these things are around a dollar fifty each, dollar twenty-five. Uh, some of them are uh, like fifty cents. So some of them are, most of them now are a dollar. So you can figure if I need, you know, 70 of them at, at say, an average of a dollar a piece. Um, of course, these, the higher voltage ones are uh, a couple dollars each. So, most of these are NTE. And then we have ketchup packets and uh, honey mustard barbecue sauce. Disc caps. All right, here here are the capacitors for the TV, and there's a few duplicates here, but not many. Um, it used a lot of point zero ones. That was a repeating value, so I picked up maybe one or two extras of those. And then for some of these, uh, for some of these low values, um, like the 470 at a thousand, there, the 68 and 82 at a thousand the 330s 
uh, I ended up getting discs for those because there's no other option. There's no other option I can find at the electronics store for a thousand volts. So, uh, some 20 gauge tinned copper wire because I'm probably going to have to extend some of the leads on these. Uh, for the, uh, like for some of the high voltage, like the boost filter and that, this is all, this is all he has over there, so, gonna have to extend the leads on these to, for the boost caps, and s some of these, the old American made ones have really long leads on them. And the newer NTE style have really short leads. So some of this is, there's going to have to be a lot of soldering done. These are some older .01s I found that have really long leads. So those will be good. Okay, it was Bennett Harris that had brought to my attention what the RCA manual said. I think I said Burnett earlier or something. Apologize for that. Uh, I am going to attempt on this board here, I'm going to attempt to very gently lift it up and take a look at the bottom. I really don't want to cut all of these out and j-hook them. There's just too much of a risk of overheating it and causing a weak solder on the bottom. So I'm gonna very carefully check this out and see if the solder traces fail real easy. I've never had a solder trace fail on a color set on me. So maybe I just got the touch. Okay, well that came out quite easy. And unlike Philco RCA, uh, designed this with serviceability in mind and they gave you enough lead length to lift the board up to access it without having to unwire wrap everything. It looks like on this board here uh, you might have to desolder this whole thing right here and that there but then it looks like the board should hinge open and this one looks like they just gave you a lot of extra lead length on this side. So this is the iron I'm going to use right here. And I will try and demonstrate the way that this looks just like the color sets to me. I'll try and demonstrate the way that I remove these. And I've never had a problem with traces failing. Now, Sylvania is another story. I've had nothing but problems with Sylvania and traces failing. If you just look at them, they lift up off the board. Okay, so this is how I've been working on these boards forever. Alright, so let's say we want to remove this this capacitor right here. Make sure your tip is good and tinned. And then the way I do this is going to be tough. Heat this guy up and add a little solder to it like you're going to resolder it and then they just lift right out. Same thing over here. This is the the part that's critical is to make sure the tip is good and wet and they just pull right out. And then, this is a little, uh, you can just, it's hard to do it with the camera in my way, but heat this up and suck, suck your holes empty. I can't see if I'm sh actually showing this. Am I showing this? Go up a little bit. So heat this up. and then suck your holes empty. Now, when you do it like this, you never put downward pressure pushing the trace away from the board. So let's see, what is this? Yep, 
This is a .001 at 1600 volts. And the replacement I got for this .001 at 1600 volts. It's an orange orange drop. Dollar uh, fifty nine for just that one cap. So let's let's uh, let's test this. Actually, what I could do is I could pull two of them off of there since I'm since I'm kind of videoing it. I'll know where they go back. So let's do this one right here. So we got one lead there and one lead there. get two nice clean holes. Let's see what do we have here. What's this one? Point oh six eight at two hundred volts. All right, here's the point oh oh one. Let's take a look at this on the good military capacitor checker. The neat thing about this is it's very accurate. It's accurate. You can measure all the way down to like five picofarad capacitors with it. And it shows leakage in milliamps. So I just got to remember how to use it. So let's see, a point oh oh one. Uh, Ten picofarads, a hundred, a thousand. So let's see. Let me see. And also, this will put a lot of voltage load on the capacitor. Let's see, we can go down here. We should. So, the eye is opening about right there. So, it's about a point, it's measuring about point oh oh one four. Now, leakage. Okay, so you got to put this on DC volts. And then this, of course, is the DC volts that you're setting it to. And this goes up to 500 volts. So what we can do is we can hold this over and then rotate this. You'll see the capacitor charge and discharge here. So there's no leakage. This one's not leaky. Okay, here's the new point oh oh one. And notice that it nulls the eye right at point oh oh one, not up here where the other one was. So the other one is way values gone up on it. Okay, here's the point zero six eight. It's measuring 0 0.078. Let's do a leakage check on it. It's very hard to do this with one hand. Put it over here and then crank the voltage up.
Doesn't look leaky. Even at 500 volts, it doesn't look leaky. It's very hard to do this with one hand. Okay, so 7, 8, let's try the new one. Here's the new one. So 7, 8 is where the other one was. Let's see. Point zero six seven. Point zero six seven. This this is very accurate for measuring capacitance. I actually bought this when I was fighting with some IF transformer, and I needed to measure some values in the IF can. Here's a uh, Dumont branded point zero two seven that's measuring. Uh, Point zero three five. Take that out. We'll stick the NTE in here. Here's the NTE point oh two seven that's measuring. Point oh two seven. Okay, here's one of those Cornell Dubler point uh, zero zero two two ceramic paper things, and surprisingly, I'm not seeing the leakage on these that I really would have expected. And this is measuring point zero zero two four, so this is not that far off. Let's do a leakage test. I'm just not seeing the leakage out of these capacitors that I really would have expected. They're all of course off value and out of tolerance but they're not leaky this is the last one on the deflection board and basically I've already changed all of these and yes I have tested every single one as I pulled it off and the new one before I put it back on to verify the value of the new one and make sure I wasn't off and this one's a 220 picofarad and it's measuring about 200, 230, 240 and zero leakage. This has got a 6.8K resistor parallel across it so I'm not going to worry about this. I think this is fine. Um, no leakage at all okay here's board one I'll recap this is the horizontal oscillator and vertical output board all recapped absolutely no problem with any of the traces all solid as a rock I didn't cut the leads real short because RCA, I left them about the same length as RCA had them. So there's board number one recap. This is the 220 I checked and it was 
it was fine. I am going to go through and test all the resistors. I'm going to take a break from this for about an hour or so because it's really kind of an irritating thing. So we have this board, this board, all of these right here, and this board. So that's like one-fifth of it done. I checked all of these resistors and they're all within their uh, band percent value, the 20% and then the 10%. So some of them are real close, some of them are right at the threshold, but they're all within tolerance. So my next step is I'm going to pull a factory service manual and I'm going to go over this with a magnifying glass and just verify that one more time that I got all the right capacitors in there and that I'm not off by a factor of 10 or put a 400 volt in where there should be a 600 or something like that. Just going to double check my work before I solder this board down. So I think I'll wrap this up as part two. Um, yeah, I'm just going to replace more capacitors. This is part three of the RCA KCS98 chassis repair, television repair, restore. And in the last part, we I recapped this board and I checked every one of these caps as I pulled them off and they had all increased in value which would definitely affect the performance of the vertical circuit but none of them were leaky. So the next thing I did was I started to change some of these in the horizontal circuit like this is the boost filter right here and it was one of these Elminco style uh, ceramic wax paper and it tested perfect value was perfect no leakage it's a thousand volt cap I can only go up to 500 volts but no leakage at all none uh, I checked this was a 0.068 same thing tested maybe a little bit high maybe 0.072 and no leakage so I was started on this board here which is a horizontal oscillator and most of these caps have very low DC voltage across them like one or two volts these are all in the uh, horizontal AFC circuit so I'm not even going to worry about these right now um, these bumblebees someone had asked about these these are horrible they leak they short they crack uh, they're just one of the worst capacitors I think was out there. They were touted as the best at the time, but it turns out that they're just garbage. Uh, this is the this is a mica. It says in the RCA manual that's a mica, and that's the horizontal uh, coupling cap to the output tube. So that's a definite hot one. I already pulled one off. I'm going to test it. Okay, this one I'm checking here is uh, C159 and it is that capacitor right there across the sine coil and it already looks kind of fishy see how the eye doesn't open completely okay let's do a leakage test on it I'll go over here to uh, fifty volts two hundred let's see uh, two hundred and fifty volts let's just go for five hundred so these these are garbage these uh, bumblebees they're garbage I'm gonna put this on the military cap tester so we can see what that looks like. 
it's measuring about 0.02 not 0.01 and let's see leakage there's a little bit of leakage there I know it's hard to see in the but it's hang it's not dropping all the way down so we'll definitely change that one and this board is not coming out I tried to get it out but some of these wires are just too tight so I'm accessing it with the soldering iron through the holes in the other side all right, I checked this, test perfect, no leakage, right on value, it's a mica. Um, replace those two, they were those uh, bumblebees, they were both kind of leaky and off value. I checked both electrolytics, I disconnected them. All five sections are perfect. The ESR is even fairly low. Uh, I pulled these capacitors and checked them. Perfect. I see we got another. Uh, that's a resistor, isn't it? Yeah, that's a resistor. IF strip is all disc. I'm not going to worry about that. Uh, might have some caps in here in the audio section. We'll have to check that out. But I think what I'm going to do right now is put it back in the set. I've lubricated all the, cleaned and lubricated all the pots. I think what I'm going to do right now is put it back in the set and power it up and see how it works. In video part one I mentioned seeing this string here. And I saw it in the SAMs, I noticed in the SAMs that they show this, is the uh, fine tuning cord. Of course this is the fine tuning on the tuner here and this up here is the, the fine tuning on the outside of the set and so um, that that dial cord is going to have to be replaced unfortunately. There's uh, oh, more, more dead spiders. Gotta love those dead spiders. Alright, it's put back together and I hate to say it, but it looks exactly the same before as before I recapped it. Looks exact well. I think the horizontal width is a little bit better. Actually, no, I take that back. It's a little bit better. It is a little bit better. We still have the twerking picture though. Still have the twerking picture and the poor linearity at the top. This could, this twerkage could be a uh, 
heat or the cathode leak or a bad ground somewhere. And also the lack of drives. Kind of annoying. Overall, the vertical is a little bit better. I'm going to try and substitute the 6AQ5 from the audio output with the 6AQ5 from the vertical output. Wow, that sucker's hot. see what it looks like now. Huh, that one seems even weaker. So I'm going to say it's not it's not the uh, it's not the vertical output. Let me get a new 6FQ7 and I'll try the OS vertical multi vibrator. I'm changing tubes now and I just did the This is a new 6 CG7 horizontal, I mean vertical multi vibrator. And it still looks like we have exactly the same, exactly the same vertical with the torquage. So next, I'm going to change the horizontal output and see if we get the width back. Okay, this is with a brand new 6BQ5 horizontal output tube. Uh, well, I put the old 6CG. That looks like it did something to the twerking. The twerking looks almost completely gone now. I still see a little tiny bit. Oh, maybe not. Here it goes. Why do I not have the width? We do have a width adjustment, but why would that be off? Okay, I think the next thing to do is check the capacitors in the width circuit. And there's one, there's a capacitor across the width coil. And I'm not quite sure about this issue up here at the top. So, uh, okay, back to the back to the workbench. It appears we're only at about eight kilovolts on the high voltage, which seems like it's only half of what it should be, and that would explain the lack of width too. So I, I got, maybe it's time to start um, 
start doing some of my regular troubleshooting rather than just cap changing. This is why I usually don't just change caps. Uh, time to uh, do a cathode current and take a look at our uh, voltages on our horizontal output tube. I already changed that. Um, I really don't want to screw with this horizontal drive control. I don't want to start turning these things yet. Change the damper. I could do that right now. What is that? A 6AX4? See if I have one of those. New damper tube, same thing, lack of width. Okay, I'm going to do some voltage checks here. I, I got my uh, test socket on there and I had to kind of rig this because the lead's not long enough. So I basically, my main thing I want to see here is I want to see the screen voltage because that'll that'll tell me a lot right there uh, by measuring the screen voltage which should be 160 volts that's pin 4 this is going to be so dangerous and of course 4 is on the bottom this is going to be so dangerous, I'm going to have to set the camera off and do this. Alright, we only got 145, which isn't too low, and it's kind of coming up slowly. But usually, if this voltage is low, either the B-plus is low, or the screen resistor is high, or we have an overload in the flyback area. If we had lack of drive, this voltage would be high. And we only got 9 volts on the, on the cathode, and the cathode is supposed to be 12, and the cathode goes through some resistors. So assuming those resistors are okay, which I can check those, um, we have low B plus maybe? I don't know. Maybe I could change this 5U4. That's one of the things I kind of forgot to do. B plus is supposed to be 255. It's at 254. Can't complain about that. Nothing wrong with that 5U4. Uh, maybe it's maybe I got too much drive to this tube. Let me check that. That's pin pin five is supposed to be negative 20 volts. Okay, the grid or the yeah, the grid is supposed to be negative 20 and it's negative 8. Well, why wouldn't that be excessive drive then? I adjusted this, um, which is a horizontal drive control. And it got quite a bit better. It filled out the screen and it's quite a bit brighter. But I'm still not quite seeing the voltages I would like on this thing. So i got to play with that some more. I tried a different tube and it's the same thing I'm gonna try a drive tube and then maybe check some resistors well I believe I found a weak or something horizontal oscillator tube uh, it tests okay but I change it and the the drive goes from negative 15 up to negative 20 um, and this is kinda interesting because a color set the high voltage goes up as the drive goes down and this is the opposite of that. Well we are definitely getting better with this. Uh, I don't see the twerking in the in this so it could be that that's a maybe the capacitors in the alignment generator are starting to go bad. Also I smell something burning and I can't quite put my finger on it. No, none of the current draw is high, but something is going to blow up here because I can smell it. It's like an oily chemical smell. I don't see any smoke. I got the contrast up a little bit high.
this is the other NTSC generator and it's still got the little twerky movement very very hardly noticeable though I can barely see it. I want me to hook the big one back up. Oh yeah, this one's much worse. It must be bad filter capacitors in the NTSC generator. I hardly ever use these things, so... This is the NTSC generator that has about a hundred uh, tantalum capacitors in it. Those don't really ever go open though, they just short. Yeah, I'm going to say the twerky thing is uh, the generator, not the TV. It's uh, always good to have crappy test equipment really throw you off. This thing is actually looking really good. I just got to figure out what the burning smell is and let it run for a while. I hope the burning smell is not the power transformer. The power transformer is putting out exactly the right voltages but it's humming pretty loud and the smell is this kind of heavy oily petrochemically burning smell. It's not like a resistor or something like that and all the other transformers are cool and the, it's not the flyback. Listen how loud this power transformer is. I don't know if the camera is going to pick it up, but... Very loud. To feet, and interestingly enough, your family will be involved in this treatment program. This is a bit of an annoying they, uh, sound. They'll be a part of that, so uh, it's a... It's a scary step, and it's a big step, but... Um, Wonder what's up with this. What well, this is interesting. I changed the audio output tube to 6AQ5, and the hum is totally gone. You're in a women's only program surrounded by women who are all in recovery. Now, here's another tube that tested good on the tester. It was slightly weaker than the 6AQ5 for the vertical output, but it tested fine. No leakage, no shorts, but yet there is a ton of hum, and um, yeah, I don't get it. Consented to it? No. Had a trial? No. I put the old 6AQ5 audio output tube back in there. Okay. And it worked perfect for about 15 minutes. And then it started doing this. And I was measuring the, um, measuring the cathode, and it goes to basically 0.2 volts. And it's 12 volts when I, it should be 12 volts, and that's what it was when I put the tube in there. So the tube goes funky after about 15 minutes. As last State of the Union address, the unemployment rate has fallen below 7% for the first time since the Great Recession. Some of that because there are more jobs, but also some of it because people stopped looking for work and are no longer counted as unemployed. Since the President's last State of the Union speech, more Americans believe the country is headed in the wrong direction. 61% up from 54% a year ago. And the President's job approval rating has dropped from 52% to 46 Joining me tonight are Bob Schieffer, our Chief Washington Correspondent and anchor of Face the Nation, and Nora O'Donnell, co-host of CBS This Morning. Nora, you've been talking to your sources at the White House. What's in the President's speech? The President tonight, in his State of the Union, will promise a year of action, is his words. He will also address the concerns about economic inequality in this country. But it follows, quite frankly, what has been a year of inaction. The President, last year in his State of the Union, talked about minimum wage, talked about immigration reform, talked about gun control, all of that unfinished business that he will try and talk about again tonight. But he'll need Congress's help on those. 
And while Congress has been unwilling to act on many of those measures, the President tonight will be talking about executive actions, things he can do on his own to help this is this is in widescreen. You can see the you can see the the gap here at the top and at the bottom. This is in high def. For the president to enter in a short time here, Bob Schieffer. One of the things that the president's staff has told us today is that the president is going to say he will work with Congress where he can, but he will bypass the Republican House where he has to. How do you think that's going to play? Well, he has not done that in the past. I mean, he has been he has been has used executive uh, power uh, sparingly, uh, much less so than uh, any of his predecessors in the modern presidency. Well, this uh, is I the TV's kind of first run. I hope it doesn't I commit mean, suicide. Uh, you know, he announced today that he's going to increase the minimum wage for uh, government workers. Uh, but what he's talking about, those that are employed under future contracts. The Republicans, John Boehner said this morning, said he is going to help absolutely no one who's now on the government payroll now, that all of that uh, will come for, for future contracts. So, you know, uh, the part that I have a question about, generally when you say, uh, if I don't need your help, uh, you don't get it, you know. So we'll see how this goes over and how this, uh, how his program unfolds tonight. He has a very modest uh, list of proposals he'll be talking about tonight. Much of it, uh, repetition, as Nora alluded to. This um, kind of sizzling buzz you get when you get the text right here in the audio. I'm going to try and adjust that out, but that's kind of a typical thing of old TVs. Saw Especially when you're driving it with a, you know, a widescreen, high def signal like this. Coming after a period of time in which there's been a great deal of trouble in Washington. There was the government shutdown only a few months ago, and also the. I thought the New York Times had a, a good headline today. These political uh, things are a good, good test for the TV because they're real high contrast. A lot of black suit, dark black suits with white shirts, and um, a lot more contrast than this TV would have ever been exposed to when it was when it was made. As we are watching the members of the House and the Senate and the President's cabinet filling the House. Hey, something that his economic advisors have told him may become his economic legacy if he doesn't intervene. Increased income inequality, stagnant wages, and a growing sense of Americans that in the middle class they have a hard time staying where they are and they fear they will not We've be We've come a long to way and we have more work to do. He will do and ask Congress to take steps with him to address this underlying economic problem. Some of it structural, some of it political. The president will also address what Bob Sheeper was just talking about. He will say we have a bipartisan agreement to avoid government shutdowns for a couple of years so at least there'll be no self-inflicted Everybody waiting for the announcement of the president, which we are expecting at any moment. There's no entrance quite like the entrance that the president makes when he comes onto the floor. And here it comes. Speaker Boehner, Mr. Speaker, gavel. the President of the United States. Looks good. I, I got good definition in the faces. Looks really good. Uh, no cloudiness. Really looks good. Might have it. Might have it up crystallized a little bit too high on the fine tuning, but. Scott, but uh, members uh, come in there hours before this so they can get next to the aisle there so they can uh, talk to the president and I should also add get on television. If they don't come, they send uh, a placeholder 
uh, to do that. I mean, this is really the walk down ego alley, as it were, because, you know, the president gets a big standing ovation. He's going to get another one when he gets up there, uh, and it just goes on and on. It's whatever the politics, and there'll be a lot of politics this year. The first lady in her box with several guests invited for the occasion. Waiting for the tubes in the teleprompter to warm President up. Handing the speech up now, and stand by for another ovation. Members of Congress, I have the high privilege and distinct honor of presenting to you the President of the United States. Thank you. And here we go again, right on the cue. This is uh, political theater, Bob, in uh, in Washington's finest form. You always wonder what this night is like for the uh, Vice President and the uh, Speaker of the House. They get to sit there and look at the back of his head, uh, a speech that goes on for more than an hour, and they have to make sure they don't nod off, <laughs> because speakers, they're on display. Some speakers have described this as the longest night of their Mr. year. Speaker, Mr. Vice President, members of Congress, my fellow Americans, today in America, a teacher spent extra time with a student who needed it and did her part to lift America's graduation rate to its highest levels in more than three decades. An entrepreneur flipped on the lights in her tech startup and did her part to add to the more than eight million new jobs our businesses have created over the past four years. Look at the Morier on the guy's tie. An right here. Fine tuned some of the best, most fuel efficient cars in the world and did his part to help America. Let's zoom in on that tie right there. A farmer prepared for the spring after the strongest five year stretch of farm exports in our history. A rural doctor gave a young child the first prescription to treat asthma that his mother could afford. A man took the bus home from the graveyard ship, bone tired. All right, well, let's see if it lasts an hour. This channel is broadcasting it in four by three, full screen. My fellow Americans, no other country in the world does what we do. On every issue, the world turns to us. Not simply because of the size of our economy or our military might, but because of the ideals we stand for. Utah Data Center. Today. There you go, that one's widescreen. No one knows this better than those who serve in uniform. As this time of war draws to a close, a new generation of heroes returns. Generation of heroes returns to civilian life. We'll keep slashing that backlog so our veterans receive the benefits they've earned, and our wounded warriors receive the health care, including the mental health care that they need. We'll keep working to help all our veterans translate their skills and leadership into jobs here at home. And we will all continue to join forces to honor and support our remarkable military families. A proud Army Ranger at Omaha Beach on the 65th anniversary of D-Day. Along with some of his fellow rangers, he walked me through the program and the ceremony. Sharp as a tack. And we joked around and took pictures, and I told him to stay in touch. A few months later, on his 10th deployment, 
Corey was nearly killed by a massive roadside bomb. In Notice how that sounds. His comrades found him in a canal, face down. And now listen to Channel 4. Shrapnel in his brain. For months. For months, he lay in a coma. And the next time I met him in the hospital, he couldn't speak. Could barely move. Let's try 11. Over the years, he's endured dozens of surgeries and procedures. Surgeries and procedures. Hours of grueling rehab every day. Even now, Corey's still blind in one eye. Still struggles on his left side. But slowly, steadily, with the support of caregivers like Try his dad, 13 Craig, and, and see what that one sounds him, like. Corey has grown stronger. Day by day. And walk again. And he's working toward the day when he can serve his country again. My recovery has not been easy, he says. Nothing in life that's worth anything is easy. Corey is here tonight. And like the army he loves, he's up and he does not quit. Wow, it's on. That's interesting. 2-2 two, two is, is widescreen and 2-1 is full screen. 4x3 and then 16x9. Well, it hasn't blown up yet. Well, it made it. President Obama's fifth State of the Union address coming to a close with a rousing tribute to Sergeant First Class Corey Rimsburg, who the president met when he was able-bodied and then met again after Sergeant First Class Rimsburg's 10th deployment, 10th deployment when he was wounded by a roadside bomb in Afghanistan. The president's speech had an optimistic tone. It was sort of a can at a time when much of the country is in a doubtful mood, having recently watched the government shut down and the troubled rollout of the Affordable Care Act's website. The president talked about the need to rebuild the trust of the people who sent us here. Bob Schieffer, he highlighted six areas where he said he would act if Congress would not, saying that he would use the power of the pulpit, the bully pulpit, and, and executive orders to take action if the Republican Congress wouldn't help him. I think that's the lead, that's the news lead. Someone was asking about the continuing spot, meaning the CRT is weak. And uh, this CRT is not weak. It's not testing weak. It's showing good highlights. Um, so this is a fairly accurate description. Luminescent spot reminds it remains at the center of the screen for a few seconds after the receiver is turned off. The afterglow results because the anode voltage remains on the filter capacitance. So I guess that would mean a CRT on this one. The spot really does not damage the screen. However, one method of eliminating the afterglow is to turn the brightness up to a maximum beam current just before you turn off the receiver. Then the high voltage can discharge quickly. I did actually have the brightness turned down fairly low in that video. Uh, I try not to run these things with the brightness up real 
real high. With weak emissions, the raster picture cannot be made bright enough. Insufficient brightness can also result from voltage troubles. However, weak emissions result in characteristic silvery effect in the white areas of the picture when you turn up the brightness. The cause is saturation limiting of the beam current emitted by the cathode. Then the details are lost in white highlights. That's what I usually just call cloudy. I think that's a general thing. This is a book somebody gave me. This is, and I've never actually really read this, but this is this is probably the most detailed television repair book you could ever ever want. This goes through just about everything. It's only uh, only what about 500 It's only 711 pages. I'm sure, there's going to be a bunch of, bunch of searches on eBay for this right now. Here's what it says about inner carrier buzz. If you'd like to pause on this and read it, go for it. One thing that's interesting here is it says uh, troubles can be caused inner carrier buzz are defective stabilizing capacitor in the ratio detector overloaded uh, distortion in any of the IF stages common to the picture and sound and the overload can be caused by a weak amplifier or incorrect bias well this set doesn't have AGC and core processor, 5 megapixel autofocus camera, live piece TV, English, Urdu and Bangla, over 80 hours of Dr. Zakir Naik's videos, over 50 authentic Islamic applications, over 100 Islamic wallpapers, over 200 Islamic ringtones, Islamic nasheeds, books on Islam and comparative religion of Dr. Zakir Naik, living life easy and convenient, communicating with technology par excellence, fostering your innate relationship with your creator, enriching your life on the move moments, Islamically secured. Experience the difference. Peace Mobile, the solution for humanity. Okay, this is part four of the RCA KCS 98. And I am going to attempt to align the sound. Yesterday, during the state of Obama's speech, I was um, trying to adjust this guy right here uh, for minimum buzz, which is what the SAMS says to do on the front page, but then also uh, they give directions on how to zero this thing, you know, the S curve, like an FM radio. So what I'm going to do is, this is 4.5 megahertz, I'm going to try and do a quick alignment on this. And RCA is nice enough to give you access holes for the test points. And uh, let's give it a shot. You have to do the thing with the two resistors in series, uh, the two 100Ks on this, to uh, zero. zero the core. So let's see, I want to go for 
Well, let's see where this thing is. See where this peak's at. Eh, it peaks about right there. 4.4, so it's it's off. It's not real far off. But, you know, let's uh, dial it in. Come on. There we go. Alright, so we want to turn... Couple of these scroogey sprinklers in here, which I can't see them. Get a flashlight, so we got one right there. So we want to peek this one. Interesting how it goes up and then drops back down. I'm sure this is really exciting video. But this thing's weird. There's a really long delay. Good enough. Okay, let me do the other one. Okay, here's the other one. Ah, that one wasn't that far off. Close enough. Okay, now to zero this guy out. Uh, DC probe to point H and G. Okay, so there's G and there's H. I wonder what you use. Am I on H? I wonder what you use F for. Huh. Or F is just the thing for the other thing. To make that thing hook up to the other thing. Okay. So you want to go between H and G. See there it says to zero that out. And then somewhere here... Where was I reading that? Oh yeah, here we go. To eliminate sound IF detector buzz, adjust the ratio detector secondary A15. Well, how can you just blindly get in there and turn it? You know, I mean, is minimum buzz also the zero point? Okay, I'm between H and G and it's at 3 volts, so let's see. Jeez, just keep on. Okay, something's wrong here. I should be able to run this from positive to negative.
Okay, something's wrong here. Okay, I figured out what's wrong. Sam's has got the cores uh, reversed. It's the one on the outside. And right here, just to prove I'm not on drugs, A15. Adjust for a zero reading. We go over here. Can even turn the page. Right? There's A15 right there on the outside. I mean on yeah, the inside of the the circuit board. So what I need to do is remove this from here. Put this back on ground. And then what I need to do is I need to go and I need to peek, re-peek this one here. Okay, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn the one on the outside. Wow, look at that. There's going plus. There's going plus. There's going minus. And that is one touchy adjustment. So we want to zero it out. No wonder why I couldn't affect the buzz last night. I was turning the wrong core. So then what happens if we turn this, if we change our frequency, it should go positive. Now I'm going the other way and it should go negative. Wow, look at that. So let's see, let me zero it back out. I'm not looking at the Uh, look at that. Good enough. One of the things I failed to address uh, was the burning smell. And the burning smell just went away. And it didn't come back. And last night when I was doing the alignment on the IF, there was no, or the, the sound rather, there was no uh, no burning smell at all. So I don't know, maybe it's the NTSC generator maybe the capacitors are failing in it I and that's what's causing the uh, hum in the picture I'm gonna pull that apart and see what the power supply looks like but right now I want to see if I could get this tuner out and you can see there's a sprocket right there that's the drive that, that that's on the outside that's where the channel selector knob is and then there's a drive sprocket right right there uh, where that string you can, well, let me see if I can get it out I was reluctant to take it out because the knobs are uh, from 1957 and they didn't want to just pull off real easy and I'm kinda reluctant to force them and break them should just work a couple more of these dead spiders in. So you got one there. Got one down here. Let's see. Light that sucker up real good. And we got one right there. All right, here's the tuner assembly. And we can kind of see how this... So this is going behind this one, and then this makes a full loop. This 
makes a full loop around to there and then this is tied look at that it's actually got a little brass crimp connector crimped over it and the quality of these things was just so good so simple to work on okay so that goes like that and then it comes around and goes down there and then comes up front and the hard thing is just duplicating this that's why I'm so we wanna we wanna start with this and it comes down here and let's where's the other end of it and it looks like it wraps around here three times wraps around here three times and then it goes back so what I'll do is I'll document this all then I'll pull it all off and since I got it's just broken I got the size of it I will um, just make a new one and um, put it back on should be pretty easy so start from the back around down under uh, I don't think it does a figure eight there although it almost looks like it does a figure eight right here yeah it must because of the angle those are at so it does a figure eight so it comes off the back here three turns over ar over around and up all right well our, we are all good to go here This is um, this is not something that's high use, especially now with uh, that you're going to be using a digital converter box. Just set it. Going to pretty much just set it and forget it. I guess I could go a little bit tighter there, but I'm not. I'm really not going to worry about this. Like I said, you just just going to set it uh, near crystallization and uh, forget about it it's not critical I think this is pretty close to RTV this set does not have AGC so the, the uh, the contrast is just all over the place. Go ahead, I'll come at you. Yeah, antenna TV. Alright, that's as much of that as I can handle. One of the greatest Bible teachers on prophecy I've ever heard. Glued. So this is like um, non-stop Christian pop music videos. I think that's what it is. Oh, 
Professor, I have a question. If someone wins a carnival game, won't they, like, want humongous stuff fuzzy dice? Wow, you are right, Callie. We never thought about the prizes. <laughs> and I this is not dim at all. I know it looks dim, but it's actually Why pretty you bright. Have a garage sale like I did. You had nice stuff, Cal. A little bit of a drive line. I was trying to find our TV, but I don't know. There's so many of these channels. I wanted to see how the buzz was on our TV, because it's still buzzing quite a bit. Quickly, Tuesday is the preliminary hearing. In Newport Beach, Michelle Geely, KCAL 9 News. Overseas today, an appeals court in Italy has upheld a guilty verdict against U.S. student Amanda Knox and an ex-boyfriend. The two had been convicted in the 2007 murder of her British roommate in a love triangle. Well, I'm going to call this a wrap. Case I now? think this thing is good. It's been running for a couple hours now, and the guilty verdict in a Florence courtroom. Amanda Knox was not there to hear. You know the buzz. I can't get rid of it, so I'm not gonna screw with it. Former roommate Meredith Kircher. Knox's lawyer called it a heavy sentence and vowed to appeal. Even with the verdict, this is not the end of the legal battle. It still has to go. It doesn't seem to buzz on older programming. Just this modern stuff with the high contrast text. This was the third trial for the 2007 murder of Knox's roommate. Knox. Okay. What? The 80s called. They want their store back. It's time for a new Radio Shack. Hey! Come see what's possible when we do things together. This is part four or five of the uh, RCS KCS 98E uh, fix up. And what I've decided to try in order to deal, deal with the audio buzz is to feed a the composite signal out of the cable box or uh, converter box directly into the um, audio stages so these two stages right here and what I'm going to do is I'm going to disconnect this wire here off the point zero one and try feeding um, the, the audio directly out of the box into here and that that capacitor, that point zero one, is right here. So I'm going to disconnect uh, the yellow wire there that comes from the um, detector discriminator output and feed hook an RCA plug onto there. Sorry. Auto emergency braking on the all-new Genesis from Hyundai. From these historic sands. See, you'll notice there's no buzz, no noise. The sound is really good now. The great American race returns. February 23rd, only on Fox. Your NFL, your way across all your devices. Sign up now at NFL.com slash now. You know how our family has daddy? Can probably do and the uh, commercials. Yeah, that's right. Pretty soon, you're going to have a baby brother. And a puppy.
change what the web has become, but we can change what it will be. A better web starts with your website, Squarespace.